Hey, welcome to my talk on deterministic prover zero knowledge. This is joint work with Neil Bitansky. So let's jump right in with zero knowledge. So this is a wonderful notion introduced in the work of Goldwasser, Semikali, and Rakoff back in 1985. Uh, the prover and the verifier have some common statement X, and the prover is trying to prove that the statement belongs to some language L. So there's uh, some interaction between the prover and the verifier at the end of which the verifier either chooses to accept or reject. So this protocol has three properties. The first is completeness, which says for every statement that's in the language, the verifier actually accepts. The second is computational soundness, which says for every statement that's not in the language, uh, no computationally bounded prover can make the verifier accept. And the third, which is the most important property for this talk, is zero knowledge, which says for every verifier there exists a simulator which can simulate the view of the verifier. What do I mean? So the view of the verifier in an actual protocol with the honest prover is the messages that the prover sends and its own random coins. And the zero knowledge property says that the simulator on input X can actually sample the distribution that's you know, approximately close to the actual view of the verifier thereby hiding any additional information that the prover might have. Okay. So across time, there have been many flavors of zero knowledge. The one that we've just seen uh, is on the left and we call this the GMR zero knowledge definition. And the next is that of auxiliary input zero knowledge. So it turns out when zero knowledge protocols are used uh, in within other protocols as a sub protocol or when you want to compose zero knowledge protocols, the verifier might actually use information that it's uh, learned from other parts of the protocol or from previous iterations of the protocol. And to account for this, uh, we give the verifier some auxiliary input denoted here by Z. And we say that the same holds, that the view of the verifier can be simulated by a simulator as long as the simulator gets both the input X and the auxiliary input Z. And the third notion is that of black box zero knowledge, which uh, asks for a universal simulator which can simulate the view of the verifier. And additionally, the simulator uses the verifier only in a black box manner with Oracle access to the verifier. So these are like the three flavors of the zero knowledge that are important for this talk. So when zero knowledge was uh, brought up, it was on two foundational aspects, which is interaction and randomness. And in this talk, we ask if uh, we have a prover that's completely deterministic, can we have some meaningful notion of zero knowledge? So the first answer to this uh, with respect to deterministic provers was provided in the seminal work by Goldreich and Oren that showed that um, having a deterministic prover satisfying auxiliary input zero knowledge or black box zero knowledge was impossible for non-trivial languages. Uh, so in the positive direction, there has been some work. Uh, this work recently by Fanyo, Nielsen, and Venturi showed that if you have a language that has a witness encryption, you can get a slightly weakened notion of uh, DPZK, uh, which is honest verified DPZK for the same language, which is to say that the zero knowledge is only required to hold for honest verifiers and not necessarily for malicious one. If you have slightly stronger properties for the language L, which is a hash proof system, then you get uh, stronger properties in the corresponding DPZK. For instance, here you get uh, soundness against computationally unbounded cheating provers. And very recently, Dahari and Lindell improved the assumptions from witness encryption to doubly injective one-way functions, uh, but at the cost of having the honest provers be inefficient. Uh, and for malicious verifiers, they actually construct BPZK for languages that have some certain entropic guarantees from their witnesses. So, so this, given this understanding, there are lots of gaps in characterizing uh, when deterministic prover zero knowledge is possible. So our result aims to fill in this gap. Uh, we actually split auxiliary input ZK into two parts. Uh, the one on the left, which is the new one, is uh, the B bounded auxiliary input ZK, which says that there is some polynomial bound B on the amount of auxiliary input that's fed to the verifier. And we actually show that uh, you can have zero knowledge uh, satisfying either the GMR ZK or B bounded auxiliary input ZK with a deterministic program. So specifically our result in terms of assumption, we require slightly strong assumptions. Uh, we show that assuming non-interactive witness indistinguishable proofs, sub-exponentially secure indistinguishability obfuscation and one-way functions, uh, there are two message DPZK for NP intersect co-NP. And if you want to go to all of NP, you additionally require uh, keyless collision resistant hash functions that are sub-exponentially secure. So given these strong assumptions, we actually show that some of this seems to be inherent in the sense that 
if you have a DPZK for any language L, it actually implies a witness encryption for the same language. And witness encryption, as we know of today, uh, is only implied by strong assumptions. So actually, let's go to our construction uh, for the two message DPZK. Uh, the starting point of our construction is the honest verified DPZK by Faunu, Nielsen, and Maturi. And since they constructed from witness encryption and witness encryption is very central to our work, let's actually see what witness encryption is. So witness encryption for a language L comes with an encryption algorithm and a decryption algorithm. The encryption algorithm takes in the statement X, the message M that uh, someone wants to encrypt, and outputs the ciphertext. And the decryption algorithm, which importantly is going to be deterministic, and we'll see momentarily why, takes in the ciphertext, uh, string W, and outputs either the message or some bot. So the correctness requirement says that um, if W actually is the witness for the statement uh, in this given language, then the decryption algorithm returns the message M that was encrypted. And the security says that if the statement's not in the language, then the ciphertext hides the underlying message. All right. So given this definition of witness encryption, how do we actually use this to construct honest verified DPZ? So the verifier here uh, is quite simple. Uh, it samples a random string of say length n, uh, uses uh, the witness encryption scheme with the statement x to encrypt uh, this string u. And then it sends across the ciphertext to the deterministic prover who simply decrypts uh, the ciphertext. And since uh, decryption is a deterministic process, it can actually do this deterministically get some u tilde and sends u tilde across to the verifier. And the verifier just checks if u is equal to u tilde. Uh, so the completeness follows just from the correctness of the witness encryption scheme. So as long as the de deterministic prover has the witness, it can decrypt and get back uh, this value u. Soundness follows from the fact that when the statement is not in the language, uh, the ciphertext completely hides the message. So we can just switch it to an encryption of zero and the cheating prover wouldn't be able to tell even if the cheating prover was randomized. And lastly, for honest verifier zero knowledge, because the verifier behaves honestly when the simulator uh, initializes the verifier with random coins, it essentially knows what you, the verifier, is going to pick. So simulation is actually quite simple for honest verifier DPZK. So how do we get from here to malicious verifier DPZK? And we take an intermediate step for, of explainable verifier DPZK. So what are explainable verifiers? So these are verifiers that can behave maliciously, but all of the messages that the verifier sent can be explained using honest verifier coins. So unlike some related notions of semi-malicious adversity, these coins might actually be hard to find. So one important consequence of this definition is that the simulator no longer knows the message that an explainable verifier encrypts, as in the case of the honest verifier DPZK. So our previous simulation strategy won't work. And actually, if you look at the uh, proof of impossibility in the Burbank and Oren, it actually already implies that um, Oxford input DPZK for explainable verifiers is, is impossible. So making progress with explainable verifiers is an important step in getting uh, DPZK against malicious verifiers as well. So as with most ideas going from honest verified DPZK, honest verify ZK for that matter to uh, malicious verify ZK, we use some additional trapdoor statement that only the simulator can use, uh, but a cheating prover cannot. So what is this in our setting? So as we already said, explainable verify DPZK is ruled out uh, for uh, auxiliary input uh, zero knowledge. So we have to bound the amount of auxiliary input. So it's actually simpler to think of the verifier plus the auxiliary input being bounded by some uh, B value B. So we can say that the verifier, the size of the verifier plus auxiliary input is bounded by some amount B. And so what the verifier does now, in addition to this uh, honest verifier uh, protocol that we've already seen, it samples a really large string R of some uh, length N, where N is much larger than B. And it uses this R as a statement for a separate witness encryption scheme. And we'll see momentarily what that is. It encrypts the same message U that it sampled before and generates a ciphertext. So essentially now there are two ciphertexts that encrypt to you, one using the statement X and one using this new statement R. So what is the language that this witness encryption is used for, this new witness encryption? So the language is here given at the bottom, which is that um, for any string R, uh, we say R and some machine M belongs to the relation. 
if M is a Turing machine, then outputs R. And more importantly, the size of the Turing machine is small. So here specifically, we're going to say the size of the Turing machine is some B plus lambda, right? Okay, so the prover itself actually uh, doesn't do anything else. Uh, it behaves exactly as in the honest, ver honest verified uh, protocol and the verification also remains identical. So the verifier, in addition to whatever it sent, also sends across the ciphertext. And obviously, because the deterministic prover doesn't know the language uh, or the statement for the second ciphertext, the verifier has to send across R. So completeness follows the same as the honest verifier setting because uh, the deterministic prover doesn't do anything else and the verifier's check is actually identical. So now for soundness, we need to argue that given this new ciphertext, the cheating prover isn't able to suddenly uh, come up with uh, decrypt you so that it's able to cheat. And this actually follows from the relation description of the relation, which says that, uh, you know, R is a really large string and we want a really short machine to output R. And with high probability, no such machine exists. So a cheating prover is unlikely to succeed here. And what about zero knowledge? Uh, for zero knowledge, uh, we require a machine that outputs R. Do we have such a machine? Of course, the verifier itself. As you can see in the first message that it sends across, uh, the verifier also includes a string R. So the simulator can therefore just use the verifier's code to, as the witness for the second uh, ciphertext and get back U tilde and then sends across U tilde, thus completing the simulation. Um, to a point of note is that the verifier's randomness is simulated by a PRG, so therefore the overall description of the verifier can still be small. Um, I sort of brushed this under the rug, but if you look at the relation carefully, it's actually not an NP relation because we do not a priori bound the running time of the Turing machine. We said, okay, the bound of the size of the Turing machine is some B plus lambda, but it can run in any arbitrary polynomial time. So to actually have an efficient witness encryption scheme for this relation, we require this strong uh, assumption of indistinguishability obfuscation for Turing machines. So given we have explainable verifier DPCK, how do we get to the malicious set? And this is the idea here is quite simple. Uh, the verifier just simply proves honest behavior. And as long as the verifier is able to prove that it generated both the ciphertext uh, correctly, then you can essentially have the same simulator that you had for the explainable verifier DPZK. So how does the verifier uh, construct such a proof? So for the case of languages that belong in the intersection of NP and co-NP, the verifier proves using a non-interactive with this indistinguishable proof that either it behaved honestly or the statement X is not in the language. Clearly, because um, L is also in co-NP, X not in the language actually has a witness. And for uh, zero knowledge, the second statement is going to be false because we only consider zero knowledge for X in L and therefore, uh, an accepting proof must indicate that the verifier behaved honestly. So that's great. So what about the case for L uh, belongs to alpha NP? This is a little more complex. Uh, so the verifier still proves that it behaves honestly, but the OR statement, it proves that it is committed to a collision of a keyless uh, hash function that is collision resistant. So essentially, uh, the second statement says that, you know, it's something that's hard for an auxiliary uh, B bounded auxiliary uh, input verifier to compute. So as long as in the zero knowledge setting, as long as the second statement is unlikely to hold true, it must be the case that the first statement is true and therefore we have a verifier that behaves honestly. So given now this, we now have gone from honest verifier DPZK all the way to malicious verifier DPZK, admittedly under uh, strong assumptions. And then now let's, that gives us a perfect jumping point to the next part where we see, talk about the necessity of these strong assumptions. Specifically, we show that if uh, a language has a DPZK, it also has a witness encryption scheme. So to do so, we actually uh, talk about this uh, uh, notion of a predictable argument that was introduced also in this work by Fanyo, Nielsen, and Maturi. And here again, the prover and the verifier interact in a protocol uh, with some common input, the statement X, and the prover is trying to prove that the statement X belongs to some language. Uh, with predictable arguments additionally impose is a structure on this protocol, uh, which is that the verifier actually knows or expects the prover messages to be of a certain okay. So what the verifier does is runs this algorithm V, gets as input V1 and P1, uh, sends across V1, gets in response P1 tilde, and it only proceeds if P1 is equal to P tilde. So this is the predictable part of it, is that the verifier actually knows 
the prober message. And it does this for the next round, uh, generates v2, p2, and does the same thing, and so on and so on till the end of the protocol. And clearly, since the prover is not providing any new information that the verifier doesn't already know, the verifier can actually run this entire algorithm v at the start and just send it one after the other. So there are lots of common and natural examples for this kind of a predictable argument. For instance, uh, the most common example is that of graph non-isomorphism where prover and verifier are given a pair of graphs uh, and the prover wants to prove to the verifier that these graphs are actually non-isomorphic. So in this protocol, the verifier picks a random bit B, uh, permutes randomly permutes the graph GB and sends it across the prover and the prover is supposed to uh, figure out what the bit B was that the verifier picked. Uh, so essentially, since the verifier is doing the picking, it knows what the expected response from the prover should be for it to accept. So this is a predictable argument uh, for graph isomorphism. So what does predictable arguments have to do with you know, DPZK or bitness encryption for that matter? So Fania and Nielsen and Venturi actually showed that uh, predictable arguments for any language actually implies bitness encryption. So all that we are left to show is that DPZK for a language actually implies a predictable argument. Uh, so let's look at that transformation then, and the idea is quite simple. So what does the verifier do? The verifier runs the simulator on the statement X, gets a simulated transcript, and also the random coins of the verifier. And as a first step, the verifier uh, simply rejects if the simulated transcript is not accepted. And this can be done efficiently given all the information that the simulator outputs. And now it sends across this message V1, and the prover in this predictable argument behaves identically to the DPZK prover. So the prover doesn't change at all. It's just that the verifier has simulated this transcript and uses the simulated messages as its own uh, verifier messages. Okay, so the idea seems simple enough. Now we need to argue that it's actually a complete and sound protocol. So for completeness, it just simply follows from the zero knowledge property that the simulated uh, prover messages and the DPZK messages have to be the same. Otherwise, we can just have a distinguisher that looks at the simulated messages and the prover messages and can tell them apart. So uh, when we actually run the protocol with an honest prover and honest verifier, the verifier actually accepts. Uh, great. And what about the next case, which is soundness? So here, uh, the first thing to note is that the verifier only starts interacting with the prover if the simulated output uh, accepting transcript for a statement that's not in the language. So when simulator was run on some X, which is not in L, the simulator still produced produce an accepting transcript. And given that the cheating prover was made, able to make the verified accept, it was, means that it sent uh, these P1 tilde, P2 tilde, then matched um, the simulated transcript. Therefore, the cheating prover is actually able to come up with a transcript that made a verified accept. So as long as the underlying protocol is sound, a cheating prover shouldn't really be able to do this. Uh, so for this argument, we actually made this uh, simplifying assumption that the simulated uh, transcript uh, produces pseudo-random verifier coins. While this is not exactly true, in the paper we use a more subtle argument to argue that you know soundness still holds even if the simulator doesn't produce uh, uh, pseudo-random uh, coins for the verifier. Okay, uh, so in, you know, when we talked about our positive construction, we showed uh, that there exists two message uh, DPZK and this somehow seems to be inherent because we show also in our paper that any DPZK argument can be collapsed into two messages. So even if you have like an arbitrary uh, message DPZK protocol, it can be collapsed into two messages and also can be made extremely laconic in the prover message size. So for soundness, roughly one half, it suffices for the prover to send a single bit. And these actually follow from transformation on predictable arguments in uh, this work of Faunio, Nielsen, and Venturi. Uh, since they don't really care about zero knowledge, what we show is that their transformations also preserve zero knowledge as long as you start with a zero knowledge protocol. Um, so yeah, that essentially brings us to the end of the talk. To sum up, uh, for assuming like strong primitives, we actually construct two message DPZK for all of NP against bounded auxiliary input verifiers. And we show that some of these uh, strong assumptions are inherent by showing that uh, DPZK for any language actually implies the witness encryption for the same language. 
so thanks a lot. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out by email. Um, the paper is also on ePrint, uh, so here's the link for the paper. And you can also obviously ask me questions during the live talk.